Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I'm looking forward to being back tonight to see the premiere of that. Pastor Allen, thank you for this privilege. Uh, I don't consider it a small thing that I get this moment in a pulpit that you respect and handle very well that you've shared this with me, so thank you. And happy 130th, uh, ACAC, do you realize you are older than tea bags, crayons, and cheeseburgers? <laughs> Those didn't exist in 1890s. That all came later. You, are, you do share a similar history with basketball. This YMCA director in, in uh, New England had the excitement of keeping the young adults busy during a no long winter, and so he tacked a peach basket 10 foot high on a wall and gave the students a soccer ball and wrote 13 rules, and Sundays have never been the same for some of you. Uh, NFL launched the same time, not the NFL, but professional football launched the same time as the Allegheny uh, Athletic Association defeated the Pittsburgh Athletic Club in the first game where a professional where money was exchanged for a player. So that all began at this time. You, began, you share the same history and birthday as the zipper. <laughs> there, there's, some, there's some metaphor there somewhere for you later, but you can preach on that later. Uh, escalators, radios, the, the diesel engine, the motion picture camera, all that was being invented at this time as this was the era of people like Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, Nikola Tesla, George Westinghouse, the Wright brothers, Henry Ford, lots of innovation going on at the time. And somebody said, let's start a church. <laughs> the, we'll come back to the time of the 1890s in a moment, but the passage of Scripture that I felt out of all the 1,189 chapters in the Bible, the chapter I'm taking us to today is Psalm 11. felt like this was the word of the Lord for this day. They sang these things, you know. This is for the director of music. It's of David. And he starts out very with a very terse statement, kind of like on the back of our coins that says, In God we trust. He says... Yahweh, trust in the Hebrew or in the English. In the Lord, I take refuge. Amen. That's a good start to any song. That's a good start to any day. Good start to any psalm. And then it moves. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to the mountain? Here's what's happening. A voice has gotten into David's head. Have you ever, ever had that happen? Social media, some friend, some former coach, some former, you know, person of influence in your life. They said something and it got into your head. And it got into David's head so much that he had to, like, make a poem about it, to, to write about it, to interact about it in his own soul. And evidently it wasn't just in his own head, but it was kind of a public theme at the time is the way that I assume what's going on here. How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to the mountain, for look, they say. The wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. This is not bow season for deer hunting in Pennsylvania. This is an attack upon those who are followers of Christ. By the way, let me just say, I'm speaking today to those who have committed their lives to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If that's not yet your condition today, then just watch with envy. <laughs> as the church worships and assembles and then realize that the offer is for you as well. But I'm speaking today to those who are committed followers of Christ and we know what it is to have that whisper out there that you people who think you're righteous, who think you have a God, who think that you have an eternity in heaven, who think you have forgiveness, just know that you are a target And there are those who already have their weapons ready to release. The arrow is already on the string. The bow is bent. They're hiding in the shadows. They're hiding in the gloom. You can't necessarily see them, but they're there. Oh, the insidious voice of fear that tries to say, even if you can't see it, it's all messed up. <laughs> it's how news media makes their money you know, by instilling fear in us, even if there's nothing really to fear. Flee like a bird. You're being shot at. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's the next verse. 
Well, we know the answer to that question. When the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? We can wring our hands and worry. We've done that a few times through the years. We, we, we can go on the offensive and, and try to attack the evil with some shouting matches and picket signs and angry whatever. We can, we can bury our heads in the sand and pretend that it's, everything's okay and that there really is nothing going on that's wrong in our culture or society. We, we, we can create conspiracy theories. There's a lot of things that we can do. What can the righteous do when the foundation are being destroyed? Well, there's a lot of options. Uh, back to the 1890s when this church was launched. Politically, uh, President Grover Cleveland holds the distinction of being the only U.S. president to have two discontinuous terms, meaning he was elected once, lost the next election, and then got elected on the third election. He sets the record at the time for using the veto, veto power the most. 584 vetoes from President Cleveland, just indicating the cultural calmness, the political calmness of that moment. <laughs> Politically, it was a time of this. Economically, the panic of 1893. We hear about, we think about the Great Depression in the 30s. Wait a minute, 1893, there was a run on the banks and there was a crash of the stock market, a, re, a depression that lasted five years. Estimates are that of the 12 million families in America, 11 million were in poverty. Yes, this is the day of J.P. Morgan and Carnegie and Rockefeller and all those big names who had mega wealth, but the wealth was not distributed and there were labor disputes and strikes and a march on Washington from those who were demanding better pay. It was a time of economic challenge for most Americans. And theologically, the 1890s was part of an era where the convergence of enlightenment's emphasis on reason, Darwin's origin of the species, and biblical criticism, modern biblical criticism that treated the biblical text as if it were just a historic document rather than the divine revelation, the word of God. And those convergences led many away from our historic understanding and practice of the faith Politically, economically, theologically, it was a disruptive time. And somebody says, let's start a church. Pittsburgh, that'd be a place. <laughs> hmm. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that somebody didn't listen to the voices? Flee like a bird of the mountain. It's time to just fold up. It's time to just, you know, financially we can't step out. Don't you know all the pressures? Don't you know all the people? Don't you know all the confusion? Don't you, don't you, don't you? Just quiet. Somebody believed that Pittsburgh needed a new expression of gospel testimony that proclaimed that Jesus Christ is Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, Coming King. Somebody believed that Pittsburgh was ripe for the presence of this gospel message and an expression of the Holy Spirit that could be lived out. Somebody believed that the world needed the local church to arise and to care about the whole globe, not just their community. Somebody believed that the church had a mission in this world and that God wasn't done writing a good story in this world. Somebody believed. Somebody risked. Somebody risked wrote checks, somebody prayed, somebody strategized, and 130 years later, we are those who benefited from their faith. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Now, it's fascinating to me because... At this time, there was also a strong emphasis on eschatology, the study of the end times, and the strong preaching about Christ coming back at, at any moment, which we believe and which is true and which we celebrate. Christ can come back and, and will come back at the moment the Father releases him to return. But how then shall we live? Well, that creates an interesting question. See, I don't believe that many of those who started this church during that era of time ever thought that there would be a 130th anniversary celebration because Christ is coming back. And, and so one evidence of this is, is across the straight line in New York, we have a conference center that is a historic one, and one of the cottages there just had to be rebuilt. A lot of the cottages were built for future generations, but one particular cottage owner had a tree that he cut down and then used the stump of that tree for the foundation for the cottage. 
And guess what? A hundred years later, that, that, that stump rotted and they had to rebuild the foundation for that cottage because somebody had the view of, well, Christ is coming back so we don't need to plan long term. I believe that you can firmly believe in the imminent return of Christ while still planning for the next generations. And so Pastor Allen has said to me very clearly that one of the purposes of an anniversary celebration like this is not to only look back at the past and celebrate what God has done, but to look to the future in faith. And as and Pastor Rock has so well said to us just moments ago, to believe that his promises are still good, still real, still valid, and that there's great work for us still to do in this kingdom and in, in advancing his kingdom. And so, yes, we look back with celebration, gratitude, and honor, and we look ahead in faith. And I say to those of you at the moment in this church, bless you for your investment now because future generations will receive the benefit of your faithfulness, your finances, your prayers, your volunteering, your sacrifice, your pursuit of justice in this region. Future generations will benefit from your faithfulness just as you are the recipient of the prayers and financial giving and faithfulness of those of the past. It must not stop with you. The task is too great. Christ's heart is too passionate, the need is too large, and our gospel is too good for us to say, well, thanks, that was fun, I got to have it, and then it just dies. No, 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 no. Amen. Amen. Future generations will benefit from your faithfulness today. Carry on, church. And one of the greatest seeds that you can sow at this particular moment is the seed of peacemaking, quietness, and trust. We have a hand-wringing hand moment in this society that turns into a finger-pointing moment in society where we blame leaders for all kinds of things. This is a hard time to be a leader. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Do we turn a blind eye to sin? No. If there is evil among us, even among top leadership, it must be dealt with. And the Christmas Alliance said, all moments in time, somewhere in the country has some discipline case going on where we're dealing with a situation where a pastor or a leader has had some sort of error in their life or theology and we must address it because we can't turn a blind eye to sin. But that being said, Church of Jesus Christ, we just need to chill a little bit <laughs> in reference to our leaders that, that uh, they've been placed over us by God's authority for our good and and we are to serve them in such a way that they can serve with joy. That's Hebrews 13. Go back and read it later if you've forgotten it. Hmm. So, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? <laughs> When my wife and I were house hunting in Columbus a few years ago, we moved the national office and our family from Colorado Springs to Columbus. And it's all going very well. I'll tell you about that some other time. But when we were house hunting, we found one particular house that we both liked. And that was already the small miracle of the day that we both liked the same house. And, and so we, we got a home inspector to, to take a look at it. And the mouse droppings were, well, I can probably figure out the source of that. And uh, a couple of the other issues, like, ah, oh, we can deal with, with that. Radon, well, that's a pain, but you can a few thousand bucks, take care of it. But, but when, when the main floor windows didn't close quite right, I started like, something's, something's up here, and the house inspector took us to the lower level, and when he used the word structural engineer, that's when I tapped out. <laughs> uh, if the foundations are being destroyed, I'm tapping out. <laughs> Church, listen to me at this moment. In this text, that is the voice of the enemy that said that phrase. Flee like a bird of the mountain, for you're being shot at with drawn bows. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? That is the whisper of the enemy. That is the mock of the crowd. That is the slithering snake in the branches trying to deceive the church of Jesus Christ. That is not the word of God to your soul. See what happens in the text. See when the 
<laughs> when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? We can look more carefully at the text and see what it's really saying. Now, they sang these things, right? And I'm, uh, many times in the 150 Psalms, there is a mid-Psalm transition where there's the evil that's being demonstrated, but then there's a transition to the truth to be proclaimed. And here in this one, the change is right between verse 3 and verse 4. The quotation marks, which aren't in the Hebrew text but are added in many of our English versions, they end with verse 3 with a quote of the mocking crowd and then the voice of God, the voice of reason, the voice of the poet faithful to, the, to his king says this. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes the sons of men. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates on the wicked. He'll rain down fiery coals and burning sulfur. A scorching wind will be their lot. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. Upright men will see his face. You hear what happens musically? I'm imagining this, but I'm, I'm thinking there was some low-toned, vocal-only, minor key as the song starts out, real subdued. We acknowledge the enemy's voice, but we don't want to give it too much power or credence. But then there is that little nod from the worship leader, whatever hand signals they got going on up here. I don't know how the whole thing works. I'm not a musician. I just know that all of a sudden, the keyboardist is using all 88 keys, and, and, and the, the, the guy with the lead guitar is using all 10 fingers at once and the bass guitar is kicking in and the drum cage is taken off and ready to blow up and all the vocalists are standing up and the congregation rises just as we just did and says the Lord is on his throne the Lord is in his temple <laughs> see the simple fact is follower of Christ your foundation cannot be destroyed it is unmovable unshakable 1 Corinthians 3, there is no foundation other than the one that can already be laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation for the church. He is the foundation for your soul. He is the foundation for your faith. So why can we stand on the promises? Because the promises are built on the foundation of our Christ himself who is unmovable. Friends, your foundation cannot be shaken. Do not confuse contested ground with cracked foundation. Is there contested ground? Well, yes. There is battlegrounds all around for those of us who want to <coughs> have righteousness and justice and truth upheld at this moment in time, just as there was 130 years ago. There are contested places of faith, yes, but again, I repeat intentionally, do not confuse contested ground with cracked foundation. Your foundation is just fine. No structural engineer needed. You know the verses, Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected, the stone that the builders despised, and did not understand who he was, thought that he was stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. See, Isaiah 28, I lay in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. He will be a sure foundation for your times, a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure. Isaiah chapter 8, this, the word of the Lord came to me with a strong hand upon me saying, do not fear what these people fear. Do not call conspiracy what these people call a conspiracy. Do not dread what they dread. I am the one they are to fear. I am the Lord is the one that they are to dread. I am the one they are to consider as holy and I will be a sanctuary for my people. So church, 
Your foundation's fine. And don't give in to the lie of the enemy that says that there's some instability of our foundation. The voices are loud and steady. Flee, you're getting shot at. Our voice needs to be loud and steady as well. We know the response. We've been given it right here in the passage. The Lord is in his temple. The Lord's on his throne. The enemy wants a hand-wringing church. Jesus sustains a praise-singing church. You're living that out here, ACAC. Celebrate you for it. I was given a gift recently, not for me personally, but for the archives, the Christmas Alliance. I don't usually preach with that much energy, so anyway, <laughs> sketch it up to me. First hymnal, the Christmas Year Alliance, 1891, just a couple of years before you came into existence, we started putting our songs into print. Uh, this was given to me as a special copy because it's actually the copy of Mrs. A.B. Simpson, the founder's wife. 692 8th Avenue, New York, New York. If lost, please return to its rightful owner. <laughs> Sorry, Margaret, can't get this to you right now. <laughs> but... One thing they say in their opening is that, fascinating, that uh, old songs are still needed, but new songs must be sung. Every generation must have new songs. So they incorporated some old songs in here, like Rock of Ages and All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And they included some new songs in here, like Standing on the Promises. It's one of the brand new songs that was written right before this hymnal. And <coughs> they put it in categories. They said that they were only the second hymnal to put songs into categories. And so, no surprise to you, as a Christmas Alliance hymnal, there's a category on, not category, that's a game. There's a category, <laughs> there's a category on salvation, Christ our Savior, and sanctification, and, and healing, and, and Christ's return. There's a category on service. But before we get to any of those sections, the first 40 hymns of our first hymnal, first 40 songs, the entire section is on the Holy Spirit. Just as you lead your DNA statement here at ACAC by referencing the leading of the Holy Spirit, this is how that they modeled for us. I believe there is a message embedded in this early hymnal for the Christmas Year Alliance family today that this is how we were formed, this is how we are to live, and this is how the next generation will still be blessed by the church. Yes. If every generation learns to listen to, be led by, obedient to, and walk in the Spirit, day by day, moment by moment. A decade earlier, Dr. Simpson had been a pastor in New York City at a very prestigious church. It was that kind of place where he had a good salary. Um, over $160,000 a year was his pastor's salary in today's equivalents. And, and he um, had new members come into the church. Every meeting of the elders, uh, so, and they had new members. Church was growing. One day he went down to the uh, boat docks and to the places where new immigrants are coming. Oh, by the way, another thing about the 1890s, Ellis Island opened up. Same time as this church did, within a year of it. And new immigrants were coming in mass to this country. And everybody just welcomed them with open arms and said, we're glad you're here. No. No, it was contentious back then as well. Dr. Simpson went and preached. hundred new immigrants came to faith in Christ. He came home, celebrated with his elders. Rejoice with me. hundred new people have found faith in Jesus. They said, where are they from? Well, the Italian sector. They said, that's great. They've come to Jesus. They can't come to this church. And Dr. Simpson resigned, walked away from his ordination, his salary, his parsonage, and everything. They had five kids, teenage on down to infant. His wife wasn't real happy. She'd sing later, but she wasn't singing right now. <laughs> he put an article, he put an advertisement in the New York City paper. If you're concerned about reaching the unreached masses of New York City, join me for a meeting. A lot of people came to hear him preach because he was a famous preacher, but when he called for the follow-up strategy meeting, eight people showed up. 
They gathered around a wood stove on a cold October day in the Caledonian dance hall. And he, we have the journal of Dr. Simpson as he reflected on that day. And he talked about the eight people gathering around. They opened their Bible to Zechariah chapter 4, which says, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And also says, Do not despise the day of the small things. And Dr. Simpson wrote in his journal after that day, We thanked God that we were few and poor and weak, and we threw ourselves upon the power of the Holy Spirit. That is a birth moment of this denomination that you're part of, that just a few years later, this church arose out of. May we never stop to walk in that manner, church. God bless you. Thank you. just want to close with a few remarks. First one's a little more personal. I am so humbled and honored to serve as your pastor. And uh, all weekend, I've been just telling God, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you dearly. You're not always easy, but I love you. I know I'm not always easy either, so it goes both ways. Um, the second thing, though, I want to say is I want to thank a particular group of people. Um, those of you that have given sweat, blood, and tears to this place through the years and some even decades. Those of you that have come in town uh, that worked here vocationally. Those of you that have come in town to visit because this was your church home. and For years you served in kids ministry, student ministry. The families that moved into this neighborhood, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, when no one was moving here. Those that you have given sacrificially. I want you to know that those of us that are new like me, we recognize the price that was paid. It is by God's spirit. We thank him first, but he uses his people to accomplish his purposes. And I want you to leave today knowing that this church in 2024 says thank you. And we want to build upon your legacy. Would you stand to your feet this morning? The last group that I want to address is all of us, and I may put a particular emphasis on those who are fairly new. And there's a lot in this room. The Lord birthed in me a question, and, it, and at first I thought it was just for me, but I recognized it's for all of us today, and that's this. What will we do with the fruit? We see the fruit today. What is some of that fruit? 131 missionaries that have been sent out from this church over its 130 years. I know of at least 19 churches that have been planted from this church over the last 130 years. The countless ministries and ministry partners that have been birthed out of this church that are still ministering today. The literal millions of dollars that have been given to global missions and local missions to look around and see the beautiful diversity that we enjoy in this moment. What will we do with the fruit? Will we eat it and just get fat on it? Will we store it and save it for a rainy day? Or will we be the ones, the next generation, who digs deep into that fruit and finds the kernel, the seed, and contests the ground and plants and prays that the Holy Spirit will water it because there is still a people that need to hear Jesus and he is calling us to share that gospel to. There are still places that need to see the light of Jesus Christ and there are still purposes that he has called this congregation to do. As I close, the people of Israel face that exact moment. God had used Moses 
a faithful leader to lead him out under the Egyptians. His season was over and there was a new leader. There was a new place, there was a new people and there was a new purpose. And in that moment, they had a choice. And in this moment, we have a choice. We can sing the right song on the wrong side or we can rejoice now and recognize that whatever the path is ahead, the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 130 years, let me just tell you, the diversity we enjoy today, that was not an easy path. There are people that are not here today. They couldn't walk that journey or pay the price. The church is planted, the missionary sent, the money given. There is a cost for all of that, and there will be a cost for what ahead lies ahead. But may I say to you, what was said to Joshua and was said to Israel in that moment. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord personally will go ahead of you. He will be with you and he will neither fail you nor abandon you. Would you grab the hand of the person beside you? I know I just made some of you uncomfortable. It's all right restrooms are clean you can wash your hands later <laughs> spirit of the living God fall fresh on us and what I believe is a new critical marker and season we need a spiritual boldness more than ever before so would you fall on us we need a spiritual, courageous spirit more than ever before. Lord, you know the tasks that are ahead. So God, lead us. Reveal your plan and your purposes. And may we live out that boldness, strength, and courage. And may we rejoice and sing the right song on the right side. Knowing that you already have gone ahead. And that there is no need for us to be afraid. There is no need because we know you have not abandoned us and you never will. So Spirit of God, lead us as we recognize it is not by might. It is not by power, but it is by your Spirit. Amen and amen.